Okay, back to the reality of the talk, however. Six days. So we have six days of Genesis going forward, and we want to look at it and try to understand it. So to do that, we have to look deeper into the text and try to understand how the words flow. So some of this I will say with tongue in cheek, but I hope you'll take it as that and see how it, it develops as we go along. As we read through the text, many things are happening, and then the, the flow of the information is always locked into the end of the day. There was evening and there was morning day one. Everyone is probably familiar with that. He, Edder, Evoker, there was evening and morning day one. More things are happening. There's evening and morning a second day. More things happen. I apologize, my book is highly annotated because it's annotated by me. Uh, uh, evening and morning a third day. More things happening, evening and morning, a fourth day. Each day is marked by there's evening and morning. But if you ever happen to notice an amazing phenomena, evening and morning, day one, evening and morning, a second day, evening and morning, a third day, you come to the fourth day. Does anyone recall what happens on the fourth day? I see someone with the text over there. What happens on the fourth day? The sun, yeah, the sun. A little embarrassing, huh? Evening and morning, day one, evening and morning, a second day, evening and morning, a third day, the fourth day comes the sun. I mean, pretend we don't think that God wrote the Bible, okay? Well, pretend there's like a bunch of Bedouins sitting around and say, oh gosh, you get up to day four, I forgot the sun. Oh, I forgot the sun. I mean, that's what the text says, right? There's evening, morning, evening, and morning, and the sun comes on day four. Good grief, I forgot the sun. What am I going to do? Well, see, it wouldn't be a problem in 1990, 1998, right? Because what would you write the Bible on? A word processor, right? You get to day four, <laughs> I forgot the sun. What do you do? Type in the sun, cut it, and paste it, right? Windows 95, and no problem. See, but when Moses came down from the mountain, he wasn't carrying a CD-ROM on his back. He was carrying stones. See, in those days, they were in stone. And you get to day four, and you forgot the sun, you got a real problem. You just start chiseling from day one again. That's a lot of work. We're stuck with the sun on day four. I hope no one thinks that that's the reason why the sun is mentioned on day four. But that's what the text does say, right? And a lot of silly people say, oh, see how silly the Bible, and you know what I mean, the author couldn't even get that right. Well, my friends, it's been a bestseller for thousands of years. So one thing we know, even if you meet a skeptic and he says the Bible is a myth, you can tell him, but it's been a bestseller for 3,000 or 3,000 years. You know, the author wasn't dumb. That's for certain, okay? You don't make a bestseller by being foolish. But we don't have that mindset, fortunately. We realize the source of the Bible. So then why would it tell us that the sun's on day four if there's evening and morning for the first three days. And the text understands that because the Hebrew really doesn't say there was evening and there was morning. The Hebrew says there was Erev, uh, thank you, there was Erev and there was Boker. Erev is a, it has a derived meaning of evening. Ayin, Resh, Beit. There are three Hebrew letters that spell evening. Ayin, Resh, Beit. Erev, evening, the root meaning is chaos. That's why evening, twilight, is called Erev. Because when the sun goes down, what happens to vision? It becomes chaotic, right? Blurry. That's why you don't walk along the edge of the road in the evening time. The car might not see you. And Boker, morning, Beit, Kuf, Resh, morning, is called morning because the root of that is orderly. Amazing, huh? Suddenly a whole new meaning comes out of the text. All that time that you might or might not have wondered why does the sun show up on day four when I have evening and morning for the first three days is because the text is telling you something much deeper than there was sunlight and there was and then there was and then there was sun sunset and sunlight sunrise. There was disorder and order. And the Torah wants you to be amazed at this fact. Amazed at it. It wants you to see that you start off with a world that was unformed and void. The Hebrew is tov bohu. Chaotic is the Hebrew translation of the word. It was chaos. The text tells you it was chaos. Science tells you it was chaos. And gradually, day by day, out of this chaos came the symphony of life we call humanity. In the subtle language of the Bible, out of a disorderly system, came the orderly system of, of life itself. And that had to have a guide. Now, much of the guide is built into the universe. The creation, when the Lord created the universe, we get, from the physical aspects, we get four things, time, space, matter, and the laws of nature. And these guide the world. These guide the world in a way that is, to think that these, the tuning of the universe can be by chance is beyond, it's just beyond 
possibility. I had the good fortune of meeting once and corresponding a bit with a, a, a physicist I, uh, in the uh, Nobel Prize winner, Stephen Weinberg. He's, a, he's at the University of Texas in Austin. Okay, and he, he is a very strong supporter of Israel, but he feels that the Bible is a myth. Okay, a myth. But by his own words, he says that the universe, in writing, the Scientific American, October 1994, that the universe is tuned to one part in 10 to the 120th. Had the energy of the Big Bang been different, which means that is a one with 120 zeros after it. I'm going to take about 30 seconds to see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Well, that's 20. That means I have to have, to have like 60 rows of this, right? 20 times. I'm going to have to have six rows of this. So two, three, four, five, six. O, O, O. OK, these are all O's, right? This whole row. O, 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 O. We get to, if this had been, not this, but this, 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 and the last O had been a one, we would not be here today. The universe either would have expanded so rapidly, there would have been no time for galaxies to form, no prime, or the universe would have collapsed after a million years, and a million years is enough time to make galaxies. Just one added on to this mass line of zeros, 120 zeros, and there's no life. It's all over. The universe is tuned for life. And so when we, we take a trip, for instance, to the Dead Sea, I'm now relating back to the order and the chaos, and you go back to, down to the Dead Sea and you, and you meet a skeptic and say, oh, the guy Schroeder, the Zola Levitt brought you to hear this guy Schroeder speak to you, and, you know, he tells you you can't get order randomly, and he pulls out of the, de of the, the Dead Sea, the Salt Sea, the lowest place on Earth, a salt crystal. He says, look at that on the microscope, and you see this beautiful, beautiful crystal. He said, that crystal formed randomly. What are you telling me it didn't form? Did the salt crystal, this gorgeous crystal, form randomly? Not by chance. The forces that work on the sodium and on the chlorine force it. If anything is in random, it's a crystal. It's forced to line up this phenomenal, beautiful shape that everyone finds this great beauty in. And there's no randomness at all. If you find order in the world, it means that something is ordering the system. We are built into the universe from before day one. And that's essentially the reality of the world. So can we have evening and morning? And we move forward. And then the text discusses, the text discusses now day by day what's happening. So we're told here there's evening and morning. Day one, does anyone have other English translations here this evening? Because if it's, it's quite crucial to remember what, what the, how the text, the Hebrew is exact. As, as I mentioned, those Dead Sea Scrolls don't have a letter changed. And the end of the Hebrew word is behi edavi voker. There's evening and morning. Yom echad. Yom means day. Echad means one. It doesn't mean first. There are many English translations that say there is evening and morning a first day. But the text is explicit. It is day one. The next day says the evening and morning a second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, the sixth day. So it can be understood why a translator would write a first day, trying to make the text reader friendly. To, you know, to, so it shouldn't seem too jarring in, in the flow of the language. Editors like consistency, second, third, fourth, fifth, or sixth. Give me a first day. But the Torah says in Genesis chapter 1, there was evening and morning, day 1, for a good reason. Because 1 is different from first. 1 is absolute. First is comparative. When you say a first day, now put yourself in a mindset going back to here. Not when we know there's, that hopefully we'll be around tomorrow and there was also a yesterday and there was time before. Not going back to a time when there, when there, where there's a flow of time already, but go back all the way back to a time when there are no other days. And then you can't say a first day. Because to say a first day would mean you already know there's going to be a second day. But on day one, that's it. The text says day one to teach us that there was a creation of time, that time was created, that there was a line here before which there was no time, which is a phenomenal insight in the Torah itself, that time is part of the creation. And then it tells us something else. It tells us how the Bible sees time. The Bible sees time from a very important perspective. The Bible doesn't say there was a first day. By the second day, the Bible could say there was a second day because the second day was second relative to the first day. 
But on day one, there was no second day. So you, yeah, so you could not say a second. But by the next day, it was already relative. So had the Bible been seeing time, from, let's say out here in Sinai somewhere, when Moses gets the Bible on Sinai, the book of Genesis, then the Bible would have been looking back in time, and it could have written, there was evening, morning, a first day. Had the Bible even been seeing time for these six days from Adam? Well, by its own statement, there were six days. So it would have written, there was evening and morning, a first day. This is not me speaking. Now I'm giving commentary from over 1,000 years old. The Bible says there was evening and morning day one to tell us that the Bible is seeing these six days as a unit from a very special viewpoint, a very special moment in the universe. Any thoughts on what that moment is? Day one and not a first day. So the Bible is looking forward in time. That's why the text says day one. The Bible looks forward in time and says, wow, what an amazing universe. And it watches it create. And it says, oh, six-day universe up to here. But you see, we don't have that option. We live in 1998, or in the time of the Bible, or any time after Adam. And we look back in time. We see the unfolding of these days as history. The Bible didn't see it as history. The Bible saw it as ongoing event, on site, real time like you're sitting right here now. We look back in history, and we say, mm, how old is the universe? Oh, about 15 billion years. That's a nine, 10 to the ninth means nine zeros. About 15 years, 15 billion years. And Albert Einstein comes along and says, maybe they're both correct. Maybe they're both correct. The, the creation is described as in the following way by the ancient commentators. One Nachmanides is an example. He says the following. In the beginning, we don't know what predates this, but then from absolute nothing, God creates a tiny speck. Tiny speck. That's a bit bigger than the speck, but if I made it the actual size that's discussed, you wouldn't be able to see it. About a tiny seven, my, uh, my, a mustard seed approximately. And that's the entire universe. That's the only there is. It's not, that a, it's not a speck in a vacuum. A vacuum is space. That's the entire universe. That's it. And everything is in that universe. But it's not stuff as we know it now, like stones and planets and stars. It's just energy. All that we have in here is energy. And as this speck expands out and the universe expands, the energy changes into matter. And with the energy changes into matter, the clock of the Bible begins. See, the, the ancient commentary differentiates between the creation of time and the beginning of the clock. There's a minuscule moment, a fraction of time, that's left out. This moment here lasted less than one second. There's four zeros before the one. One hundred thousandth of a second passed where the universe was going through an amazing change, and then the clock of the Bible begins. The clock of the Bible begins when matter formed out of energy. I think a famous scientist taught us that right in the last about 90 years ago, taught us that energy and matter can be the same. Who's that scientist? Einstein. I, Albert Einstein, yeah. Before Einstein, before Einstein, it's exactly what I mentioned before that was written a long time ago, that when the light of the, of, of the Bible came into the world, it was split into two parts. One was written down on Sinai, and one went into nature. And now nature's coming to let us understand that. How could it be? That thousands of years ago, these commentators said that the creation was energy, changed into matter, and the clock formed matter out of the energy. That's when the clock began. I don't know how they figured it out. They see it in the text. They're always digging it out of the text. Now, but then we go on and we, and we have these six days' leadings, looking forward from the beginning.